Can you come and write? Okay. So, the same size as the others, write six. Wisdom. Slash experience. From a certain mindset, certain way, a certain dictionary of words, of way of dressing. We say that everything is taught anyway. <coughs> I asked it. I just wanted the same handwriting. So if everything is taught, it's not true. Everything is something that we cannot name. But if we say that this unnameable thing is a thought, we'll imagine that there's a highest pure thought, and that there are level of thoughts. If we say that a thought requires an intellectual mind, then we'll say thought comes about here, and whatever is above is not thought. Depends on the word thought, the thinking. If the thinking is only the human mind, then it goes in the human, which is 7, 8, 9, 10. At 6, it's not thought, it's wisdom, it's experience. And there is a difference between learning by memory that 2 plus 2 makes 4, and have, if you never saw two objects and two other objects and count them again and see it really makes four, you don't have the experience of this. And when you go into very deep and elevated mathematics, there are some of these formulas that we find hard to experience for ourselves. It's difficult to get an experience, but it does make sense. We have quadratic formulas and and shapes on charts and stuff with big algebraic codes, formulas. And one of good mathematicians will take each of these values and these variables and compute them. And he'll see for himself that there is some kind of result that philosophically makes sense to the premise or the system in, in which it's supposed to make sense. This is an experience. It's an intellectual experience, but it's not just knowing the formula by mind, by memory. It's experiencing by computing and saying, yeah, it makes sense. So when you make your monthly accounting or when you do, you pay your bills and you get your pays and you do your income taxes, there's also an experience. It's not just numbers. You see the numbers represent levels and quantities of interaction you have with society and the world. So mathematics if it's left only in the mind as thought is useless, but it, when it's brought into experience, it produces a real experience. So there can be wisdom about numbers. Okay? There can be wisdom about everything. So it's, it's a false idea to think that intellectual knowledge is not the truth. It's a false idea to think that intellectual knowledge is the truth. Right? Knowledge is not the truth and is not not the truth. It has nothing to do with it. It depends on the experience you have of it or not. Okay? Because truth is experience. If your consciousness has a soul to compute the feelings of coming in of experiences and the pouring out of experiences to create them, so you can roll this in and out then you, have the, you gain wisdom by experiencing. Before you experience, the first time you hop on your little bike, <laughs> you fall, it hurts, you gain the experience. And it's not intelligent to stay in balance. It's wise to stay in balance. Okay? It's wise not to hurt yourself. It's intelligent to do what is best for, for your personal egotistical gain. This is intelligent. It is wise to seek happiness. Okay? So, anyway, words and numbers. And, uh, in very small, 7, 8, 9, 10, because of, we won't be speaking of this today. 7, 8, 9, 10, just for you to keep track. Write the four numbers already just to. Okay. Seven, intellect. Sometimes I say mental, sometimes I say intellect. <coughs> this is a mental body, this is an intellect. E N T E L E C T. 
You're, you're good. Eight, emotion. Emotional. Some people say astral. Astral body. Nine, vital. V I T S. And ten, physical. One, two, three is God. This is what you are. Four, five, six is the self. The real self that experiences seven, eight, nine, ten, the human. The human intellect, emotions, life experience, and physical body. Ego starts here. In the self, there is ego. In human, there is ego. Ego starts the moment there is individuality in consciousness that came out of God. If it came out, it never came out really. It just imagined, it just focused on I am just that. It, consciousness did not say I am still everything. No, sorry. Consciousness did not say I am not everything. It said, this is what I am. Amongst other things. But it focused on, this is what I am. So the idea of individuality started. But the intellect that computes the information went deeper and it said, I am not everything. Where the self only <laughs> says, I am individual. I am a single experience amongst all the experiences. The human says, I am not the other experiences. The denial of oneness came in the human experience. That gets your mind running, does it? Breathe. Now, we will completely change the subject and practice chi exchange. So you're going to partner up and do chi exchange. Change partners from yesterday. So. <laughs>
will say, this is the Atma, the soul. And from this point, you decided to perceive through this angle. This is your open-mindedness. Okay? This is the view that you have on. So you did not stop to be the map, but you focused on one point, and from there you perceive one angle. So you can only perceive a little limited range. Okay? And you even more, you limited your range of perception, and you also limited the depth. Some people see far away in this direction, some people just see in front of their nose, and whatever the other people are experiencing is none of my freaking business. Alright? Technically it isn't. <laughs> but if you're not in a state of compassion, you're in a state of denial that it's none of your business. Rather in a state of compassion that everyone is responsible for their own suffering because I have experience of it. Okay. So the more you open up, the more you perceive. So the goal in open-mindedness is to perceive 360 degrees round. To open up your angle of view so much that you perceive just in every direction. Alright? Make sense? Imagine that this map, instead of being only two-dimensional, we pull it out of this sheet and make it three-dimensional by making some kind of Z axis to be to bring this in 3D. Okay? So instead of being just left and up, there's also depth. So the world is three-dimensional. We're a point in space. And this is not an angle, it's a cone. Okay? Just bring this to volume instead of surface. Okay? So this instead is a cone. Okay? Just to give you an idea, this is a point in 3D space and you perceive through a cone to get a certain area. So the same way I said the angle had to see all the way around, like it's in a circle, your cone, if it expands, you will see spherically in every direction. Get that? This is mat the mathematics way of explaining that. Now this is where it becomes mind-boggling. Try to get the feeling when in your mind we got from surface to volume. Expanding a new dimension from the plane of X and Y to bring Z, to bring the depth. Okay? To make it space in 3D. Okay? So get the feeling where it, we added the dimension, get that? Now on that, add a new one. We can't picture it because here we're in three dimensions. But in your mind you can imagine that there could be a fourth dimension called time. There can be a fifth dimension and we end up with ten space-time dimensions. This was demonstrated in quantum physics when they zoomed in below the size of atomic structure and they got to a point where the substance is not particles anymore like atoms everything was thought about to be particles we get to a point where the substance of the universe is so refined and small and little that everything is unified there's no separation between it's not particles anymore it's membrane but not a membrane like a surface like a tarpaulin or something it's a membrane yet multidimensional so it's goo okay it's it's the supreme jello <laughs> all right we call this the universal substance the unified quantum field and every dimension is interwoven one into the other it's a nice thing to understand it i just i speak of it i get the chills love it. I'm also starting to tap into consciousness of that. It's great to see it in a little chart like this, but what about experiencing it? Wouldn't you like to experience
becoming one with the unified substance of the universe? Regaining the consciousness that you forgot, not because you're evil and you're a sinner, no, simply because it's a full strap, we decided to do that. Okay? So you've got to put your stuff down. Remember yesterday we did conscious conscious migration, okay? Going to something else, another container, okay? You all have a bottle of water? Take a sip and taste it. Don't close it because I'm gonna have you take a few sips. Pay attention to the nature of the water. Right? Taste it, feel it, it's just normal water. Just get the feeling of what it is, okay? Now you close your bottle or you make sure not to pour it. You're gonna hold it like this, fix it with your eyes. Fix your bottle with your eyes. Breathe. When you get a good idea of, I'm looking at the bottle of water, you're going to close your eyes and imagine you are this bottle of water. And you're going to feel yourself watery-like in a plastic container and breathe and exist as the water. And breathe and be conscious that you are the bottle of water that is in your hands. You are still in your body, but you're also in the water. You're conscious of that. And you feel the freshness, you feel the water, you feel the fluidity of the thing you are. You open your eyes, get back to yourself, take a sip, and taste the flavor. You get to taste your spirit in this water. Drink it. Even those who still want to transmigrate, drink it. You get that? Taste the feeling of it. There's something else in this water. The physical sensation is the same, but there's an energy trace. There's a something there. Did you get that? Okay. It's extremely subtle, okay? So if you didn't get it, you're just normal. So we are going to do a small meditation <coughs> that involves softly breathing. We don't start now and getting the explanation because you just go want to transcend. We're going to use a word in Sanskrit which has no English equivalent, but it means somewhat the most minute, minuscule, subtle thing that there is. Anima. This is a word that you never, ever, ever say aloud until you get to the point that you have to say it for a, for a teaching purpose. And you cannot teach this wisdom until you get the consciousness of what it is, or else you'll be just like any book, because you can find this anywhere on the web, and you'll be reading stuff and it won't make sense because it requires initiation to get the higher understanding, like transmigration, eat, drinking yourself as water, and stuff like that. Okay? Anima is Sanskrit for the smallest, most minicule, most subtle, most... and it's unified everywhere, but you're not thinking of the immensity of this field. You're just focusing on so subtle and soft it is. Smallest. Smallest, smallest. Instead of saying the word smallest, minuscule, minute, subtle, undistinguible. No, it is distinguible. You will use the word anima. Okay? Everything is bathing in the universal substance that we don't perceive because we are too gross in our mind, too gross in our nervous system. 
but through consciousness if we just pay attention to the universal substance that pervades all things you will gain consciousness of it so now you close your eyes and you go inside yourself and you breathe anima in your mind just keeping it for yourself anima anima and your attention is within you you want to become conscious of what you are as the universal substance beyond the human senses. Anima. 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 You are contemplating Supreme Consciousness, Christ. The substance which is all things created, that is so subtle, it is spiritual in nature. Anima. You are gaining consciousness of you, the created Buddha, Vishnu, Christ. The substance that pervades everything is Supreme Consciousness, Anima. You don't force yourself, you just relax into it. Anima. Continue on your own. If you get a feeling you don't like, you open your eyes and you stop. Otherwise, just let yourself fall into the arms of God. Anima. Anima. need to open your eyes, you open them if you're too dizzy, but if you can keep them closed, keep them closed, and you keep on your mind, eyes open and close, anima, anima, <sighs> now you will relax, open your eyes, just be inactive, contemplate, Stay in the elevated consciousness, but be humanly aware. Open your eyes, even if you don't want to. Now it's time to snap out of it, but don't snap out of it. <laughs> stay conscious and stay here. The goal is not to stop becoming aware of your human, it's to start becoming aware of the highest God. Anima is for a scientist, the unified quantum field. It is Christ, it is Supreme Consciousness, the fabric of the universe. And anima is the simplest technique that allows you to sink into this substance. And you become filled with God. And you all did it perfectly. It's just that your human is not aware up to 
a certain level. What you all did. The moment you set your mind into this, you just get into it. It's automatic. It works for everyone. I told you that you should not teach this. You can, if you want. But if you, if you keep it private for yourself, it's like some kind of treasure that you keep for yourself. It becomes sacred. This is why we don't say mantras aloud to anyone random. It's not that you're going to be a sinner if you do, no. It's just that the more you keep sacred stuff and prevent yourself to treat sacred mantras as any mundane pebble, you're going to keep the mental attitude. When I speak the mantras, my goal is to teach you. I am in a sacred attitude while I tell them to you. I know it is elevated wisdom I transmit. So be in the state of respect. But you'll never be scolded by me for saying anima out loud in the bus. I don't care. It's for you. I'm telling you it's for you. Keep it sacred. Keep it a treasure. Okay? The only consequence of saying a mantra aloud is for others to hear it. And that's it. <laughs> All right? So the Hindu masters that scold you if you say your mantra Anima. There is a Latin word, anima, that means the personalities we have. It's not that. This is Sanskrit, it's just another language. And it means the smallest substance. And those who understand Bija Mantra, the letters, what each letter means, it makes sense. And is the matter. I is intention. M is matrix, so the matter that moves into the matrix or that is in a state of intention in the matrix of the universe, it's universal substance. Okay. It makes sense. It also means smallest in Sanskrit. <laughs> Today we are le learning means power or accomplishment something you realize something you do okay a city is something that you enact so the city or the cities are powers the more you practice anima the more you become aware of the most subtle energies that exist so you're going to start feeling chi and emotions and thought forms and waves of wisdom and eventually become conscious of your soul. Then be aware of the self as consciousness and then look at God and know this is what you are. This is the goal of this. A lot of Hindu masters say, don't do the cities. They grow your ego because you gain power by doing the cities. You gain supernatural abilities like this by doing the cities. And then you infatuate yourself and you're in your ego. I say do the cities. Gain power. Emancipate yourself. Become happy. Then do a power trip. Be arrogant. Look at the suffering you created and grow out of it. Okay? <laughs> if you can't use cities, don't have a knife in your kitchen. Because you could eventually hurt someone. Never cook with the oven. Blow on it until it's hot enough. <laughs> because you could, you could put your hand. I mean, the approach of fear is the exoteric, pagan, incult way. I'm into the esoteric, initiated, occult way. And I'm teaching you that you have the right to know what you are. Don't hide behind principles. You could do evil. You are an evil doer. 
and a good doer. You never stop being every one of those things until you notice that good and evil do not exist. That's another seminar. <laughs> In any case, Anima is the first city. There's nine cities, nine main cities. And then you got 20 more. So there's nine that you do in, do in a row over a period of few years. To this seminar, we learn the first four cities and got to have a year or two of practice just with that. Eventually, those who get the first four cities, we're going to learn the, the five others. Those who just ram one city after the other, the ego starts to fight because you become conscious you're God and your ego starts to battle and it will destroy your life to prevent you from awakening. So we just do one city at a time and see where you're at, okay? So you can do progressively and not hurt yourself, okay? But not through shame and hiding, through respect. And most of you could bear the nine cities, but not all of you, okay? And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I can just get it all, mm. <laughs> Your ego is something you don't know yet. You have an intellectual understanding of it, but until you watch it, Look at every time you've played a role. Savior, victim, persecutor. You thought you knew your ego before I told that. Okay? Look at the attachments you have. Physical, emotional, and mental. Look at the expectations you have. Through fantasy, to hope, to expectations, to taking from granted, to being egocentric. Look at all these things. There's a whole lot of stuff to know about the ego. But the more you advance, the more you gain wisdom of that. And you say, oh, so this is not a way to love also. I got one more. <laughs> I'm going to pass my exam eventually. <laughs> All right? Okay. Five-minute breaks. <laughs>